and welcome to The Watchmen. There's no easy way to say it. Israel's enemies are gaining momentum around the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, and yes, right here in the United States. Now bear with me for a minute because there is a major silver lining in all of this and we'll get to the encouraging part shortly, I promise. But first, we have to review some of the not so encouraging news. Iran is emboldened thanks to the disastrous, catastrophic nuclear deal that it has struck with the West. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei says that within 25 years time, Israel will not exist. He's even written a book detailing how he and the Iranian regime are going to destroy the Jewish state. Iran is also openly mocking the United States and has even released a video warning America that if any war happens, Iran will prevail. And they may have Russian help. The Russians are increasing their military presence in Syria at Israel's doorstep in a major way. Vladimir Putin has struck an alliance with Iran, the Syrian regime, and the terror group Hezbollah to save Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. The Russians are, not, are now carrying out airstrikes not only against ISIS, but against U.S.-backed Syrian rebels. And again, they're doing it while joined side by side with Iran and Hezbollah, Israel's most dangerous enemies. So we now have a nuclear-armed, military-powerful, expansionist Russia openly aligning itself with Islamic terrorists. How about that reset button, Mr. President? Meanwhile, Palestinian jihadists are laying siege to Jerusalem's Temple Mount over the past few weeks, rioting and violently targeting Jewish worshipers. At least four Jews in Jerusalem's old city have been murdered as of this taping. Palestinian terrorists in Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, are ramping up their attacks as well, including the murder of a young Israeli couple who were shot dead in their car while their young children watched. By the way, memo to the Palestinians, Jerusalem is mentioned literally hundreds of times in the Bible in both the New and Old Testaments. It is never mentioned in the Quran, not even once. But the jihadists don't care about facts. Although its foot soldiers are heavily involved in the Syrian conflict, Hezbollah remains armed to the teeth in southern Lebanon, and Hamas is rearming as both prepare for their next confrontation with Israel. ISIS, too, continues to draw closer to Israel's borders, both in Sinai and in Syria. Folks, that's just the Middle East. Here at home, the Obama administration has shamefully abandoned Israel. Both it and Europe badly want a Palestinian state. And hey, the Vatican has already recognized one. Even though anti-Semitism in Europe, driven largely by Muslim immigrants, is approaching levels unseen since the days of Hitler. Folks, look, I know all of this is very heavy stuff, but this is where the silver lining comes in. Take a brief tour through the past 3,500 years of world history. Pharaoh, absolute ruler of Egypt, the most powerful world empire of the day. The Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Haman, prime minister of the mighty Persian empire, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, the Tsars, the Nazis. Do you notice a pattern here? All of these individuals, empires, and nations have two things in common. They all attacked and oppressed Israel and the Jewish people, and they all eventually vanished from the face of the earth. Now that's quite a track record. Israel, on the other hand, remains against all odds and beyond all human comprehension. A tiny island of democracy the size of New Jersey, thriving amid a sea of tyranny and terror. I don't believe all of this is just a mere coincidence, but whether you believe, as I do, that God's hand is upon Israel, or you don't believe at all, 
history tells us, with apologies to Ayatollah Khamenei, that you can bet the house on Israel still being around 25 years from now. The Iranian regime, however, is a different story. By seeking Israel's destruction and promoting vicious anti-Semitism, Ayatollah Khamenei and Iran's mullahs have signed their own death warrant. So have Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, and the rest. Just as Pharaoh, Haman, Hitler, and many others did before them. Folks, it never ceases to amaze me. But the vast majority of mankind still refuses to accept or acknowledge what God promised Abraham some 4,000 years ago regarding the people of Israel. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. That's pretty cut and dry. But in the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 2, God takes it one step further, saying a day is coming when He will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat in Israel. There, God says, I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. Now, that's very bad news for Ayatollah Khamenei. Folks, it will not be easy. But Israel will not only survive, it will thrive. History and the God of all history guarantee it. Well, speaking of that disastrous Iran nuclear deal, I recently sat down with Michael Pregent, a former intelligence advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq with first-hand knowledge of Iran's murderous activities. Pregent is executive director of a great group called Veterans Against the Iran Deal, and he had plenty to say about Tehran's long trail of terror against the United States. Take a look. Well, Michael, great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you're doing great work. And I think one of the great things about what you're doing, Michael, and sounding the alarm about this Iranian deal is you're pointing out what you saw firsthand on the ground in Iraq. Right. So tell us a little bit about that Iranian involvement in Iraq, killing U.S. troops and really just uh, opposing our presence at every turn in Iraq over the past few years. Well, it actually started in 2003 when we came into Iraq. Uh, Barter Corps actually followed us in. And Bader Corps sold itself as a responsible anti-Saddam party. It was a Shia party. We, we, we looked to put uh, a Shia nationalist in power <clears throat> in order to basically make sure the Ba'athists wouldn't return. So the Bader Corps, which is Iranian-backed Shia militia, sold us as a, uh, the horse to pick in this game. And then we st saw Iran start to uh, provide funding and, and weapons and training yeah. to other militias like Jaysh al-Mahdi, also known as JAM, and then formed Kitab Hezbollah and Asab Ahl al-Haq, two prominent militias that are currently in Iraq today. Yeah, I was going to say, they're still active today oh, in Iraq. Still active, right. and, and their leaders are designated terrorists. Their leaders have American blood on their hands. And Qasem Soleimani, the leader of Quds Force, is yeah. actually on the ground leading these militias in, fight, in the fight against ISIS, but broader than that, the fight against right. Sunni charismatic leaders, uh, Sunni rivals from the Iran-Iraq war and uh, Sunni charismatic uh, males and Sunni charismatic tribal leaders. Wow. Michael, talk about in specific the kind of attacks that Soleimani and the Iranians helped carry out against U.S. troops in Iraq. Okay, well there were the explosively formed penetrators. That was a munition that the Iranians helped uh, Shia militias build. They brought them to Iran, trained them on how to use it, and actually set them up in, in Iraq and directed their attacks against U.S. forces. Uh, it was a uh, munition developed to, de to defeat our upgraded armor capability that we introduced roughly 2005 with the MRAP. Uh, 2006. So it wasn't only the explosively formed penetrators, the Iranian IEDs, they also had something called improvised rocket assisted motors where they would drive a truck up to a base and launch motors right over the wall and just basically blanket car or carpet bomb that area of the uh, forward operating base. A base filled with American soldiers. Filled with Americans and, and Iraqis. And this, these are Iranian backed attacks. Yeah, or Iran Iranian funded and directed exactly. attacks and using the weapons, Iranian the bombs proxies. supplied exactly. by the Iranians. Exactly. Uh, but something more telling than that, 
They actually planned a kidnapping uh, operation where they kidnapped uh, four Americans known as the Karbala Four. Uh, they kidnapped them in, in hopes to exchange them for uh, four Iranian Quds Force operatives captured in Rabil. Yeah. The operation went, went wrong. Uh, they went down a road they weren't supposed to and they ended up executing four Americans. That resulted, I remember that. That resulted yeah. in the discovery of a direct link between Qasem Soleimani and a Saab Ahl al-Haq, a case in Laith Kazali, and also a Hezbollah operative named Doc Duke. Wow. All three were captured, all three went into American detention, and we had evidence. We actually showed Prime Minister Maliki the evidence directly linking them to the execution of four Americans and direct involvement in the Soleimani-directed uh, uh, mission. Coming up more with Michael Pregent. Iran is not America's friend. Far from it. Stick around. A lot of people say Qassam Soleimani is the most influential man in the Middle East right now in, in many respects, at least the most influential bad actor in the Middle right. East in some respects. Tell us who he is and who the Quds Force that he leads, what they're all about. Okay. Well, Qassam Soleimani is a charismatic Iranian general, and in, in general terms, he's a uniformed Osama bin Laden. He's, he's anti-U.S. He is able to travel to Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and basically funding and directing Iranian proxy groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, and those are just the ones that start with an H. Yeah. And he goes out yeah. there and he does this. Now the Quds Force is an external operating force. Soleimani is responsible for Quds Force external operations. He has the Iraq portfolio, he has the Syria portfolio, he's responsible for keeping Assad in power for four years, he has a hand in Assad in the death of 200,000 Syrians. The Quds Force Quds means Jerusalem. The Quds mm -hmm. Force is an external force hell-bent on taking Jerusalem back. That's and their long-term strategic goal. And they answer only to the, or Soleimani uh, answers yes. to Iran's supreme leader. Yes, yeah, so, so a lot of um, Americans and White House politicians that are for this deal believe Soleimani somehow falls under a chain of command and can be marginalized simply by replacing the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, or IRGC, the Iranian uh, yeah. basically their special ops intel, right. intel right. branch that has their hands in everything. He answers directly to the Supreme Leader. Qasem Soleimani answers directly to Khomeini, and that's the problem. We don't understand that. So when we say that sanctions are still on Soleimani, uh, they're not because yeah. the Supreme Leader will give Soleimani as much money as Soleimani needs to continue right. Iran's export uh, of terrorism. Tell us about some of your main gripes with this deal. Um, obviously, Iran has American blood on its hands. That's right. number one. Uh, and number two, why you formed the organization? Well, we've been writing about this for about a year and a half in different publications from Foreign Affairs to yes. Al Jazeera.com, right. writing about Qasem Soleimani and what Iran is doing in Iraq and Syria. When we started hearing that uh, Qasem Soleimani was somehow part of the Iran deal, uh, we started diving into Annex 2. Of, of the Iran deal, which basically lists all the individuals and entities that will receive sanctions relief. To our surprise, we saw a number of terrorist generals getting sanctions relief. The leader of the besiege, Mohammad Reza Nakhdi, the guy who put down the Green Revolution, getting sanctions relief. Uh, terrorists responsible for directing attacks against the Marine barracks in Beirut, getting sanctions relief. And then we saw this uh, complete uh, logistical apparatus received sanctions relief, shipping companies, Individual frigates are responsible for sending weapons to Hezbollah and actually procuring the military equipment from North Korea, all being delisted, including the banks that fund terrorism. So we looked at Annex 2, and then coupled with that, the, Amer the president gave a speech at American University saying that anybody who was opposed to this deal was a warmonger, yeah. illogical, or an ideologue, and we, we stood at the organization the next day. What can be done to fight back against this deal? Well, Iran is cheating every day. Uh, the 13 generals that were delisted that were part of Iran's nuclear proliferation program all receive sanctions relief. And every day they say something that should kill this deal. Yeah. All we have to do is pay attention to it. And Veterans Against the Deal, we are paying attention to it. We will make sure that uh, yeah. Americans know when Iran cheats. They did it yesterday with Soleimani going to Russia again. That's right. uh, they're cheating now. And we will make sure that uh, we highlight Iran cheating with those who supported this deal. And the one thing that can be done now, right. and it's something that uh, we, we engage with Senator Manchin and Senator Cardin, mm -hmm. and we, we believe we changed their minds because yeah, they, they used our talking, the they used our, talking <laughs> yeah. our arguments in their, in their uh, uh -huh. press releases, 
And we know that any additional sanctions on Iran will force Iran t to kill this deal. Yeah. Our strategy is to get these senators who do not read the deal, who now know that this deal rewards terrorists mm -hmm. and rewards the generals responsible for getting Iran this close to a bomb, they want to impose sanctions on these guys. Yeah. If they do, it kills the deal from Iran's perspective. Right. We're getting nothing out of this deal at all. Nothing. It, not a thing. <laughs> this is... Uh, it's, it's surreal. It really is. It is. It is. You know, when the president says, uh, I will not let Iran get a nuclear weapon, you should follow that in the next 16 months. Yeah. We shall see. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much thank for reading. So Where can we find the website for you guys? Yes, it's uh, veterans against, uh, veterans against deal com. Okay. We shorten it just see to it make it screen. easy. Okay. And uh, you can also email us at veterans against deal at gmail com. Okay. Uh, just put in the subject line you want to help out, and we'll make contact with you. We're going to keep this going f until the yeah. election and afterwards. Uh, yeah. We believe veterans' voices are, should be weighted against. Uh, an administration right. leaving office in 16 years, and we'll yeah. make sure we're heard loudly. We're with you, Michael. Keep Thank it you. up, man. Take Thank care. You. Thanks Appreciate for coming it. today. Thank you. Up next, what does ISIS have planned for Rome? Stick around to find out. And welcome back. Well, ISIS believes it is fulfilling Islamic prophecies. And according to the ISIS vision, that means Rome must fall to Islam and Christianity must be crushed. My CBN News colleague Dale Hurd recently examined how ISIS plans to do just that. The Islamic State has a plan to conquer Rome. Yes, it sounds crazy, but ISIS believes the conquest of Rome is central to its mission and necessary to fulfill what Islam teaches was the prophecy of Muhammad and to prepare the return of the Muslim Messiah, the Mahdi. Robert Spencer is the author of The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS. ISIS thinks that Rome is one of its primary goals and that it is in its timetable. It has a timetable wherein in the next 10 years, by the year 2025, it hopes to bring about Armageddon, the final struggle between good and evil or between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And that uh, one of the chief stepping stones to that Armageddon battle is the conquest of Rome, which they think they're going to have, they're going to be able to do within the next five years, that is by 2020. Muslim scholars say Muhammad prophesied that the two great Roman cities would be conquered, Constantinople and Rome. Constantinople today is Istanbul, a Muslim city. Rome remains to be conquered. Once Rome is conquered in this view, within the next five years, and then Israel will follow shortly after. They also believe that it, during this time period, they're going to conquer Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, before you laugh, consider that phase one of the Islamic State's plan to take Rome may already be underway, flooding Europe with ISIS fighters under the cover of the refugee crisis. They're not talking about doing it by conventional armies. They're talking about doing it by overwhelming these lands with sympathizers from within and an influx of other people from outside. The Islamic State reveals part of its plan in its publication, Black Flags from Rome. It will use sleeper cells and expects to get help from Muslims serving in European armies and from non-Muslim sympathizers. It also wants to fire missiles into Italy that it has captured on the battlefield. This is a threat that is hard to be concerned about for Italian and foreign policy expert Emmanuel Ottolenghi. The concern should be commensurate to the reality of the threat. The Islamic State does not pose that kind of a threat today. He says Europe faces more pressing problems because of ISIS. I think that the much larger threat that we are concerned with in Europe is with the lone wolf terrorist who plots uh, a terror outrage against a school, against a supermarket, against a shopping mall, against an airport. And it is hard to see how ISIS could conquer a city of 3 million people in a nation of 60 million people. But it is not hard to see ISIS attempting it. The conquest of Rome has been a primary goal since the beginning of the Islamic State. They think that the conquest of Rome will be the complete sign of Islam's superiority over Christianity and defeat of Christianity. They also see the fall of Rome on an eschatological timeline that will culminate in a battle near Dabiq, Syria, their version of Armageddon. And they think that once this battle takes place at Dabiq, this final battle, which they see coming in by 10 years from now, in 2025, 
that the Muslims will battle the non-Muslims in this town in northern Syria, and then Jesus, the Muslim prophet, and the Mahdi will return to the earth, and they will together conquer and Islamize the world. If their plan for Rome succeeds, ISIS says it will throw homosexuals from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. But the chief target is Vatican City in Rome. And the main event, as they see it, will be the beheading of the Pope in St. Peter's Square, broadcast and live streamed to an international audience. And there was a Polish convert to Islam recently who uh, has joined the Islamic State, and he said, once we take Rome, we're going to carry out mass beheadings in St. Peter's Square. And so uh, this is the plan to, to convert uh, St. Peter's Square into a huge site of executions of people considered to be the enemies of Allah, chief among them the Pope, in order to uh, cow and frighten the rest of the world into submitting to their rule. It's a plan that for now has little chance of success. But in his new book, The ISIS Apocalypse, author and expert William McCant says, ISIS has recently taken a longer term view of the conquest of Rome and the return of the Mahdi, and is willing to wait in order to build up its forces. ISIS is already next door to Italy in North Africa. More importantly, Islamic State fighters are almost certainly already inside the country, some posing as refugees, going about their lives, waiting for the day when the battle for Rome begins. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Rome. Up next, some final thoughts. Don't move. And welcome back. Folks, I know if you're a supporter of Israel and the Jewish people right now, things look pretty bleak. But as I said in the opening monologue, God still sits on the throne. And the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He will never leave nor forsake Israel or you if you're walking with him. Well, thanks for joining us this week on The Watchman. Until next week, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace.